Uh, all right, so um, this talk is an overview of, of the work we've been doing in the past two or three years. Um, uh, this is covering a paper we published last year in SICOM, uh, but it, I'll try to go a bit beyond that. So what's the idea? Well, the idea is, uh, is that you know, the networks have become more and more complex over time. So we've got, uh, you know, a firewall there, some NAT here, you know, uh, x86 boxes doing network functions and everything. And at the end of the day, as a network operator, what you'd like to know is, you know, is the network functioning correctly, okay? So you may ask, you know, can this mobile guy, I mean, this mobile user reach some server using TCP? That's, that's a valid question or, you know, um, if he does so, in what ways will the packets be modified? As in, you know, firewalls can do lots of weird things. Will they touch any parts of the TCP header, for instance, uh, and so forth? And although these questions, you know, these packet modifications in particular seems a bit, seem a bit esoteric, there's a lot, of, a lot of protocols that depend on, you know, these low-level changes that will behave incorrectly if all of a sudden the network does something that it shouldn't do, okay? So, um, you know, you could say, I have the security policy, is there any packet that could violate my security policy, and so forth. So, um, what we're going to do is what, what uh, Brighton uh, uh, very nicely showed yesterday, which is we're going to do data plane verification, right? So, data plane verification is somehow we're going to get a snapshot of the data plane state and the data plane processing, right? So, it's not only the state that we care about, as in, uh, FIBs and uh, ACLs and so forth, but also what is each box supposed to do? Like what is the processing, right? Uh, in Brighton's case, like the, the work he, he covered, it was mostly about routers and switches. So that was sort of imp implied, you know, the processing. Uh, however, in our case, this can be, uh, you know, more general network functions. So, um, okay, so the idea is you, you take a snapshot, you generate a model, and then you put it through a verification engine that says yes or no, depending on the policy you want to verify. And uh, in this particular work, the, uh, the model will be written in this uh, Cephal language that we have developed. And I guess it's kind of self-explanatory what it's supposed to do. Uh, and the verification engine is a, basically a, a symbolic execution tool that we have developed for this language. Okay, so... Um, We've heard uh, from yesterday that, you know, there's a lot of uh, data plane modeling languages. Um, and, or there's a lot of ways in, you ca in which you can express data plane. One of them is as mathematical functions. Others, in another, in another way, you could do it with uh, uh, prolog, right, and predicates. Uh, you could do it with Boolean formulae, like, like uh, Brighton and, and Tito work. Brighton, uh, yeah. So um, I will actually go much farther, and I will say, wouldn't it be great if you took the C code of your firewall on the NAT and just verify that, right? That, that, would, that would be the golden standard. There's, there's the two problems. I mean, the first problem is, first of all, you'll have, you know, some stuff that's not written in C. So in a sense, you could say we need a common denominator. And let's, let's assume for now that, that that is C code, okay? The great thing about C code is any, anybody gets C code, right? You can program anything in it, so basically, there's no data, plane lang no data plane functionality that you can't really express in C code, so it covers everything, okay? And we have, we have uh, mature tools that can verify C code, for instance, symbolic execution tools. Uh, and the problem is, the downside is, it's actually very expensive to verify, so that's the only problem. What's been done so far is to actually choose something much, much uh, simpler, so less expressive than C code, uh, However, this is typically easy to verify, right? So for instance, uh, for instance header space analysis allows you to, to uh, express headers as bit, uh, bit masks, uh, either zero, one, or don't cares. And then uh, the function of, of any box is basically a mathematical function. You know, for this input, you have this output. For this input, you have this output. And you just enumerate input and output, and you can specify, in theory, anything. But of course, it's very inexpressive because you're, you're bound by the number of combinations and bits in the header, so it's, uh, it's, it doesn't really work. So uh, what we were searching for in this work is a good trade-off between these two, okay? And um, to understand, you know, where we should land, let's just look at what symbolic execution does, okay? So what I'm showing here is a very simple firewall written in C, okay? It's a pseudocode, right? So, okay, so what does symbolic execution do? For, for, or first, symbolic execution what it does, it allows you to run a program with inputs that can take any value. So let's say in this particular case, we say that packet P 
can take any possible value. Okay. Now, uh, okay, you start executing, and then you reach this branching point. So here you ask, if you say if p uh, destination port, the destination port of p is 80, then you do this, else you do this. Okay. So what ex symbolic execution at this point does? It, it basically uses a constraint uh, solver, and asks, is this constraint satisfiable? Okay. Uh, and the constraint solver is typically external, right? So we use Z3, for instance. And CLI uses something else I, don't, I can't remember. So, so basically, if the answer is yes, the symbolic execution, the, the constraint solver uh, uh, can answer yes by giving you an example where the constraint holds, or can answer no, and in that case, he couldn't find an example. So uh, if the answer is yes, then basically what happens is that the symbolic execution engine will e explore this path. However, it will remember that on this particular path, this constraint must hold true. But what you have here is the possibility that this is not true, right? So the, uh, the symbolic execution engine in this case, what it will do, it will negate the constraint, in which case, uh, in this case, is, you know, has to be different from 80. And th if this is also satisfiable, then it will also explore the uh, else path, right? So what's happening at this point is as if we fork two programs. On one program, we explore by adding this constraint. And on another program, we explore by adding this constraint. And these, these two programs, if you want, they never join again. Like this, like, you know. So, so basically, what we will have is on, on, on path one, we will return p, which means we've accepted this packet. And the, the answer, well, the, the return value of the function is, is p. And, and we're done. And uh, so the symbolic execution uh, path, uh, ex the symbolic execution of this path is finished here. And now we move on to the, to the other path where we free p and return null, OK? So um, I think it's, it's fairly easy to follow. Uh, so what you really have is here is you have two symbolic paths. Now, if, you, if this was a large network, these two symbolic paths will go all the way to the network, right? All the way throughout the whole network. Uh, however, the problem is that there's really only one viable packet that could, could, could actually uh, exit this, this firewall, right? So because this is. C code and it doesn't really take into account that this P is a packet and you know if the packet is dropped there's no point in exploring anymore. Um, what you end up doing is a lot of wasted work. Okay, so you end up doing uh, stuff not related to packet processing, like freeing this pointer, returning null. I mean, from the verification point of view, I don't care about this stuff. Okay. So uh, if you think about a big, sorry. Yes, yes, that's correct. That's correct. So that, that, that's, that's a completely different thing. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, I will get back to that a bit later, but yes, you're completely right. So if you have a firewall that has many rules, what's going to happen intuitively is that for e every rule, you have uh, two branches. Okay. So if the packet matches the first rule, then it's a good packet and it may actually get through. And then you match the second rule and so forth. And basically what happens here is if you write code in the way we, we, we did before and use uh, just C and, C, uh, and, and CLI, for instance, you will get n minus 1 unnecessary symbolic paths that really don't help your understanding of the end-to-end -end reachability of, of the network, and one good path. Okay? And the problem here is that this will kill you when you, when you talk about a larger network. Okay, so um, I guess the, the writing is, is on the wall already that uh, if you just symbolically execute C, C code, it's not going to scale. And the, the calculation is roughly you'll get uh, an exponential number of paths in the, uh, uh, with regards to the number of branches you have. So you have n branches, you'll have 2 to the n uh, paths in total. So, uh, and people have tried to apply, for instance, symbolic execution directly to networking. And um, the, the classic example here is a, a core router. So a core router has uh, uh, a, a fib, right? And if you have a uh, symbolic destination address, intuitively what's going to happen is that you will get as many, uh, as many paths as entries in the routing table. And you'll have the following constraints. Okay? And then you have to explore them. But the problem is, well, there's like you know, 200,000 prefixes in the routing table. So just, just doing symbolic execution of a single router is not really feasible. So, uh, what you really want, obviously, is something completely different. And that's why uh, I was chatting with, with Brighton uh, yesterday that when he asked that question, you know, 
is it linear or is it exponent is it you know np complete uh, actually we were talking about uh, different things so ideally what you would want here so what is so this is what you get with with the uh, let's just say uh, vanilla symbolic execution what is the smallest number of paths that you can generate through a router and the intuition is that a router will have a very small number of outgoing interfaces so uh, if this is a router okay let's say i have three three outgoing interfaces okay by definition if I have a packet coming in, it's a, it can only get out on one of these three paths. So intuitively, the smallest number of, the smallest amount of branching you can get is three here, regardless of the number of uh, entries you have there in the in the routing table. Okay. So the question is how you know how do you get this? Uh, another example is if you take option parsing, right? So option parsing by middle box is something that you know every middle box does. So uh, for those of you that uh, are not uh, networking uh, people or networking experts, uh, the options field in, uh, in TCP is what you use to extend the protocol. So it's a 40-byte maximum field where you have uh, options encoded as type, length, and value. And then type, and, and they are packed, basically. right? And there's some padding and stuff like that. So, so basically, the code that will go through these essentially reads the first byte, then figures out what, what it needs to do, takes the length, jumps to the next option, and so forth. And what firewalls might do, for instance, is they may uh, remove some options they don't like. So for instance, the Cisco firewall that we were uh, testing as a black box was removing the SAC option if your traffic was destined for port 443. I have no idea why, but that's what it, what it was doing. right? Uh, that's, and that was the default configuration, so we didn't do any, anything funky to it. OK. so. If you try to, so we, we actually took the kernel code, the TCP kernel, uh, the Linux kernel code that parses options, and we, we, we try to optimize it and so forth. Um, and if, if say, your, your, your admin asked this question, and you wanted to use symbolic execution to answer it, um, the, the short answer is, well, it will depend on how big the options field is. If you have very few bytes that are symbolic, meaning they can take any value, then it's OK. The more bytes you have, it, it, it's, expon it's exponentially increasing the, the verification time. So for instance, if you have six bytes of options, uh, you get one hour of verification, seven bytes, three hours, and so forth, right? And that, this is because it explores all possible paths and it just takes ages. And now the problem is, uh, you could say maybe it's fine, right? But the problem is some options, some, some TCP options are much longer than six bytes, right? So you say MPTCP, for instance, has some options, has some options that are uh, 16 bytes, okay? Uh, and then in certain cases, the ordering in which you put the options may matter and so forth. So it's, it's actually, this is, will, will never work. So um, what people do to get symbolic execution to actually work is to make it friendly to symbolic execution, right? So in the router case, what you will do, what we will do is basically re rewrite the code to get these three branches instead of 200,000. Uh, which effectively means, uh, and in, for TCP options parsing, you, you do something similar, right? But actually, if we take, take a step back and you think about what are all the possible steps you could take to make this scalable, we came up with a few principles, right? And the first, the first observation, and this is something that's actually known in the uh, verification community, is that there's a fundamental trade-off between software being able to run quickly or verify quickly from a symbolic execution point of view. So in other words, if you got your optimized firewall and you try to symbolically execute the same code, it's going to suck. And the same, the same is true if you have something that should verify very quickly, it's going to run really slowly. And that's, that's like a fundamental trade-off. So what this means is that even if you wanted to use C code to, uh, to verify things, you can't use the C code from that, that, that is actually in deployment. You need to modify it somehow to make it friendly to verification, which means you're modeling it anyway. right? Uh, the other observation is that, you know, real code has a lot of debugging, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, there's a, there's a lot of, of stuff that doesn't deal with packets in, 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 in real middle boxes. So ideally what you would want is to, to really tie one execution path to be uh, equivalent to one packet that could go through the network. And if there is no packet that is live at this point, you just stop executing. Like earlier when we saw that there was no packet, there's no point in going, taking that path farther, okay? Uh, Another observation is that complex data structures, like the packed TCP options, they really kill symbolic execution. It's just, 
there's no way. So what you want is to use some symbolic execution friendly data structures that allow you to do your work, right? However, they don't blow up the number of paths that you use. And finally, you know, <laughs> uh, this is uh, what really blows up symbolic execution. So if you have a four or, or something like that with an, and the determination uh, uh, condition for the four is symbolic, then you're, you're doomed. Uh, so, so basically, you may have some looping in your, in your models. However, they better be uh, you know, a fixed number of iterations, so stuff that you could unfold ahead of time. Right? So uh, our solution is basically, since we, we're going to model anyway, why, why bother with C? Right? C you know, is, uh, is just, it's just too powerful for, our, for our, um, um, our needs. So basically, we said, OK, if we optimize something for simple execution, what might it look like? And this is, uh, this is the, uh, the result, OK? So um, as I'll keep presenting, for those of you that know P4, you'll, you'll, you'll actually see that there's a strong resemblance to P4, right? And this was because, I mean, I, it, it's funny because it was done completely in parallel. So we, we didn't know of P4. Obviously, they didn't know of, uh, of our work. And we came uh, at it from the, what can you verify while still being expressive? They came at it as, how expressive can you be while still being able to run in hardware? And it's funny that we ended up in something similar. OK. So uh, basically, you have very limited ways in, we, in which we can uh, do data structures in, in, in our uh, language. So basically, you have two data structures, the memory, uh, the, the packet, which means you have a linear address space. Everything in here will be a header field, and that's it. So this is unbounded, but that's, that's basically it. There are no symbolic pointers. Uh, every memory access is done via concrete offsets, so you cannot have a symbolic, uh, you know, a symbolic uh, access. We validate a sing uh, every, every single uh, access, which means if uh, this is this. OK. So if I have allocated a header field here, if I try to to uh, access it and I hit here, it's perfect. If I hit here or here, I get an error, right? So this gives you some sort of me memory safety. And we have some symbolic execution con constructs as part of the language. For instance, you can say fork, which means I will basically, it's like, it's like the fork in Linux, right? It will basically just fork a new execution path. Uh, you can apply path constraints. You can think of these as asserts in C, right? And the only data structure that you have uh, um, besides the, the packet header is a map data structure that is maintained by the symbolic execution engine. So you, it's not implemented by the programmer. The symbolic execution engine gives this to the, to the program, right? So we assume this is correct. And uh, because of this, when you put and get, there is no branching whatsoever. It's like you know, constant time operation. It's like constant cost. OK, so the tool, uh, you know, it's, it's written in Scala. We use Z3 for constraint solving. And I think it's more interesting how you use it. So basically, what we have is a network model in Cepho, right? So these are files in a directory where you also specify what the links are. And one file will be for one box, OK? Uh, and the output, uh, what you also tell it is where to inject a symbolic packet and which type of packet, you know, what header fields are symbolic. And the output is all feasible execution paths. What, you know, where, where can this packet go? And let me give you an example. So uh, basically, let's say, let's say we have this uh, network element A. It has uh, ports. You know, these are input ports. These are output ports. Of course, in practice, you'll have 0 and 0 being one interface, 1 and 1 being one interface for input and output. Then we have another element. We can connect them. And then symbolic execution says, for instance, let's inject a packet P that has some symbolic fields at this input port. Uh, what SIM what does, it will basically go and execute all the associated instructions to this input port. And you know, these will constrain the values of the header field. They may modify the packet in arbitrary ways. They may do stuff. And then, then at some point, the processing finishing finishes at this, uh, at this port, and then maybe gets forwarded to this uh, port, which again, you run the uh, instructions for that port, and so forth. Okay? So what you get as an output uh, is basically the list of all instructions that were executed uh, you, you, you get, a, you get at this point, you know what are the values, what are the constraints for each header field, and so forth. OK. So uh, what might you write here? So this was the code for the firewall. OK. Uh, the equivalent code for Cephal is just this, right? 
So basically, we have this constraint instruction that just applies a constraint to the header field. And you can think of it as an assert. right? So this is an assert. Execution will continue only if this constraint holds. Okay? So what will happen here is if the IP destination, uh, well, the TCP destination port is 80, then execution will continue, and there will be added this constraint. Otherwise, uh, uh, that path will fail, and you have no reachability. OK, let's, uh, the, the nice thing here is that there is a single uh, path, right? So there is no, there's no branching. OK? Uh, this is a, a slightly uh, more complicated example. So it's a, it's a filter and a uh, DNet. It's basically a proxy, an like inbound proxy. Okay? So uh, what does it do? So the intuition here is that you've got this. You, uh, so you have this box here. Traffic from the internet is coming to this box. And then you have another box here uh, on, the, uh, on, your, on your private network. And then some packets arriving here are, are forwarded to this guy by changing the destination address. That this is what it, this is trying to do. It's like uh, you know, opening a port. So uh, OK. We start with a symbolic packet. I'm just showing the destination uh, address and the uh, TCP uh, destination port. And they are symbolic. Then we say, I'm only accepting, uh, accepting packets destined to my own IP address. right? And then I have a constraint added there. Then I say, OK. If the destination port is 20, I'm actually port forwarding this to my uh, inside network. So here I'm rewriting the destination address field. I'm rewriting the destination port, and I'm just forwarding, forwarding it to the output port. Right? Otherwise, I just forward the packet as is on output port 1. OK, so uh, if someone gives you this trace, what can you do with it? Well, first of all, you can figure out reachability, right? So if you look at whatever can reach this port, you'll be able to see, for instance, that for sure the destination port will be, uh, the destination uh, port will be 30, the destination address will be this, and all the other header fields will be unchanged. OK? Uh, then you can say, OK, what can reach port 1? Well, it's very easy to, to see, right? You'll see that, OK, all, all traffic whose destination port is, uh, is different from 10 to reach port 1. Um, another interesting, you can, uh, interesting uh, thing you can see is basically, well, we, we can detect, lo detect loops. I don't think I'll go into details of that. It's interesting that you can capture invariant header fields. So intuitively, every symbolic variable, um, even though you don't know what the value is, you can check at some point whether this is the same symbolic vari variable upstream, right? So you can say, I don't know what, what the value is set here, but I got this, the exact same thing because nobody actually overwrote this variable, right? So for those of you that know compilers, this is like a, you know, verifying the uh, static single assignment and seeing that it's the same variable that you, uh, that you uh, set uh, previously. Um, and what you also get is, since you're accessing all of these fields, they must have been allocated by, by someone uh, properly. Otherwise, you'll get an error. OK, so now let's, let's talk a little bit about the memory layout. Uh, we have two types of variables, either packet headers or metadata. Packet headers, they have, a, they have to have a specific offset, offset and uh, um, a concrete, value, uh, concrete size. Metadata are these key value pairs in the map. Okay? So uh, how do you create a packet? Well, typically, the, the, fir the first thing you do, you create this, this thing called a tag. You can think of this as a... As a as a pointer to the beginning of some, um, some, uh, some header, for instance, the IP header. Okay? And then if you create this tag, then if you want to allocate the, the fields of the IP header, you allocate them relative to this tag. This is to, to ensure that you, know, you, don't, uh, you don't have to put concrete things here. It just um, allows uh, easier programming. So um, actually, we have a shorthand. So we have a shorthand for this part, and it's uh, IP, IP uh, source. OK? And then you can assign it. So before you can assign it, you, you, you need to allocate it. Otherwise, you'll get an error. Then you allocate IP destination. Then you can, for instance, uh, assign this to, uh, to symbolic. Now, the nice thing about using these tags is that if I want to, to encapsulate a new, let, let's say I want to do IP and IP. OK? So I have my IP header here. And now I, do, I want to do IP and IP. I will basically say, well, I will decrease the value of this pointer to be L3 minus 20, 20 bytes. So it will go here. And I allocate 
my new header here. And then when I pass it on to the next box, the next box will basically see, okay, I want to see what the destination address is. I need to access the destination address of this header and so forth. And then at some point it looks at the protocol number, it figures out, oh, hold on, it's IP and IP. I can actually decapsulate and I can return here. So the tunneling is handled sort of organically and like, 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 like you do it normally, right? This, is, this seems very, very obvious, but it's actually quite different from how things were done in all other verification tools. Right, so then if you want to create a packet, then you create the layer two tag. Uh, and for instance, if you forgot here to allocate this, you'll, you'll get an error. Okay. Uh, so memory, memory safety is actually quite important. We, we actually caught buggy tunneling configurations, right? Because uh, you think there's a header there and there's not and you get an error, right? And it's, I was trying to, to explain this to, to Brighton yesterday. It's, it's actually an interesting thing because it helps us to check some verification, which you can't really do otherwise. So um, intuitively, if you have this packet header, right? The packet header here will have some don't cares. And whenever a networking box gets a packet header, the first thing it does is it verifies that it's a, it's a good packet header by verifying the checksum. Now, in verification, there is no way we can actually do this because it amounts to uh, finding collisions in hash functions, more or less. Right? So basically, we will ask, if this is the checksum, we will ask, well, is the value of the checksum, is there a combination of values here such that when hashed give this value of the checksum for all possible values, right? So in, in a sense, to be, to be able to verify the checksum code is, is, is almost like verifying collisions in hash functions and you know, that really doesn't work. So um, what Cephal allows you to do, ah, and okay, so this is the packet header and you could actually interpret this as a, as a valid packet header or a valid IP header. Okay, this is the exact header, okay? So because Normally, you can't verify checksums. There's, there's no real way to disambiguate between these two. So what Cephal does, basically, if you try to access a field here because you think this is uh, an IP header, if this is, in fact, a TCP header, you're going to access here and you get an error, right? And, uh, this, uh, and you'll figure out that you, what you think is here is not here, right? Because we have this memory safety property and you know, explicit allocation and uh, all, all accesses are are aligned, then you can basically tell which of these two you have just by checking, you know, if you have allocated values where you, where you think you should have allocated values. And it turns out, I mean, it's, this is obviously a heuristic, it's not perfect, but it turns out that for all the possible headers we, we checked, you know, all, top, all types of protocol uh, header fields, you know, all, all types of chainings, uh, we couldn't find any, any real overlaps. So, uh, yeah? yeah. Actually, we, we, we found on where it was very obscure. So it was uh, GRE. So GRE followed by UDP. You couldn't disambiguate it with uh, something else, right? It was, it was uh, yeah, something like that. OK. So um, modeling boxes is actually fairly difficult. I mean, it amounts to writing, writing code, um, and it's, it's not easy. So we basically developed parsers that take uh, take configuration files and output Cephal code from, you know, router and switch uh, following table snapshots, uh, click modular router configurations. Um, we, we also do OpenStack, but this is a newer work. And actually this was a killer. So we, uh, I had one of my colleagues do a black box testing and modeling of the Cisco ASA. It took uh, the poor guy uh, like six months. Uh, and we learned a lot of weird things about this uh, Cisco ASA. And what we also learned is that you really don't want to be doing this for a living. <laughs> 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 so it's, it's, it's very, very complex. The model we got uh, is it's correct for the behavior we were interested in, which was mostly about uh, you know, how, they, how it handles TCP options and stuff like that. But uh, we probably only covered 10% like, you know, of the functionality of the ASA. And since it's a black box, you know, there is no guarantee that uh, this is accurate as soon as you take it out of the stuff you actually tested. right? So. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a big problem. Um, okay. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about evaluation because I don't, I don't think I have enough time. So uh, this is one of, those book, uh, one of those tables where we show what we can capture. Um, and it's obviously more than other tools. Uh, that's, that's how you publish. Um, <laughs> I, I'll just come clean and say what we can do, right? Uh, so we can't really do stuff that does payload, right? You know, string matching on payload, uh, you know, 
that, that you know, you give me something uh, that requires uh, running a regex over some payload. We cannot do that. The other thing is we can't do properties across multiple flows. So if you have something that depends on the flow ordering, you know, you have some TCP connection coming and then another TCP connection coming and you'd like to try all, possible, all possibilities, what you, want, what you will need is some sort of model checker on top of SIMnet. SIMnet by itself doesn't, doesn't do it. Okay, uh, we can't also, we, we, we can't do global, global state for a, for a box. So we cannot give you a global packet counter for one, one box, right? That, that, that also we can't do. Uh, that said, we can, we can uh, do fairly good approximation of NATs and stateful firewalls. Uh, okay. So, uh, okay, so how does this scale? This is the simplest example we can come up with. So if you want, it's, uh, it's equivalent to this, uh, a router we had earlier, just uh, slightly simpler. So we, what we have is a switch with, I, I think, uh, 48 ports. Uh, and we basically vary the number of MAC entries in the switch table. And what we have here is the basic uh, standard model, you know, the one that you, that's not optimized at all and it really runs out of memory very, very quickly and it's, uh, it's just crap. And then we have two um, optimized models. And if you want, I can tell you exactly what the optimizations are because they are very, very simple. So. Uh, I'm not sure I have time for that, actually. Um, we also analyzed slightly larger networks. So we compared against this header space analysis tool that is uh, almost like the golden standard in terms of runtime. Um, and I mean, we're slightly slower than them, but it's you know in the same ballpark. So that's actually not bad. Um, and I, I guess the most interesting thing we did, we, we tried to, we, we analyzed our network. Um, this is the simplified view of the network. So what we have basically is a network that uses VLANs to carry traffic from offices to this ASA box, and then the ASA box uh, moves stuff to the exit router. This is an OpenStack cluster that we run. Um, and um, basically what we did is we, tr we tested reachability. You know, can these guys have TCP reachability to the end? This, is, this also runs on NATA, uh, by the way. So, and you know, how long does it take? Well, it depends on how many sim symbolic fields you have. If you put everything symbolic here, we, we end up uh, uh, actually uh, emulating the Mac learning and so forth so that it doesn't scale that well. But if you put some uh, concrete fields there, it's actually, it actually you know, takes just a few seconds. So what we found was we, we found two, two things that we didn't uh, expect. So we, we, we found that you know, the ASA was actually removing TCP options uh, without the administrator knowing. It was just like the default thing. And we also found that there was a buggy, uh, um, pro there was a buggy configuration in the VLAN, which meant that uh, uh, I think this particular router was, uh, no, no, no. The configuration VLAN that all the switches were in was accessible from, <laughs> from, this, uh, from this cluster and probably also from the outside. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that our uh, admin uh, was a bit embarrassed by that. Uh, so all, all of our uh, students could, for instance, log into our switches if they could figure out the password, yeah. How do you know that the moving the options is unintended? And who, whose intent are you talking about? Are you saying that? So it's unintended in that the, op the administrator did not intend to do that. And if you look at the configuration file of the ASA, there's nothing that says there that options should be removed. It's just like the default configuration. Uh, so if you read the specs or anything, there's, you know, it's not clear what they do, right? So it's not like there was something written that we remove a unknown options and so there was also this very weird behavior uh, with the SAC that we, we still haven't explained and I was asking Cisco people like what are you guys smoking you know wh wh what is this behavior and some other uh, guy working for another vendor they said you know what happened there right so they probably had a um, customer that uh, had some some bugs right so maybe they had the server that had uh, that couldn't really handle SAC on HTTPS and they just asked them, you know, can you please remove SEC for HTTPS? And somehow this made it into the main configuration and the main code and, you know, everybody got it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and, and then, you know, as a, uh, as a TCP researcher, I'm like, okay, let's see how HTTPS does compared to HTTP. So we run measurements and you figure out that it's, it's much worse probably because SEC isn't enabled, right? Um, so anyway. So, um, Cephal is an imperative, easy to write and easy to understand language. Uh, it's as close to C as we could get it, right? Um, and its purpose is to model network processing to allow you to, 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 to verify networks, um, you know, easy. Um, Simnet is a, a symbolic execution tool that, that runs Cephal models. And we actually have quite a few translators from, 
from uh, existing data plane uh, snapshots to, to Cephal, so it's not that difficult to use. Um, and you can try it, and I definitely encourage you to, to use it. Um, the next, the, the stuff that we're working on now is basically uh, trying to go to the next level. Like SimNet, you can think of it as a sort of assembly level tool, right? It's, it's very, the output is a JSON, and you have to like click page down, and you know, your eyes are bleeding, so it's not, it's not very, it's not very friendly. So um, basically, we're trying now to integrate um, some policy language and to use the policy language to drive the symbolic execution, meaning where you inject packets to, to actually guide symbolic execution to reduce complexity and so forth. Uh, another very interesting work is, is integrating it in OpenStack. Uh, I can talk to you about that offline if you want. So uh, the intuition here is that OpenStack has these different views of networking. So you if you're the tenant, you see this abstract network including firewalls, routers, blah, blah, blah. And then, then you click instantiate, and then this abstract network gets translated into actual rules, you know, open v switch, IP tables, and so forth. So we're very verifying both. So we're, we have a model for the tenant network, and that gives you uh, the tenant view of what should happen. It's almost like it's his intent. And then we verify at lower layer by capturing the IP tables and so forth, and that gives you the actual thing that happens. And now we're in the process of trying to sort of check equivalence between them. Because if they're not equivalent, then you know someone's wrong. You know maybe there's a bug in Neutron or whatever, right? Uh, actually, uh, this is this is ongoing and it's almost ready. So P4 is very very close to SimNet uh, in terms of what what you can express. So the only thing in SimNet that we can't express, uh, the only thing in P4 that we can't express in SimNet are registers, right? Uh, everything else is uh, already working. Um, and you know the bigger question is this. Uh, uh, you know like Daniel was saying earlier. We've created the gap between the model and the data plane. So a fair question is, how do you bridge this gap to make sure that you know, whatever you verify in the model actually holds in the data plane? And that's, uh, that's something I've been thinking about also a bit. Uh, so yeah, thank you.